Well, good afternoon, ladies and uh, gentlemen, and uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Mike. Good to see you and, uh, and Bill again, and uh, Kathy as well. Um, um, Katie, I mean, sorry. Um, I have uh, some remarks to deliver to you today, um, but I also uh, hope at the very end of these remarks to take your, your questions. Um, so let me, get, let me dive right into it. Um, and I'm going to just find my clicker here and get oriented so we can get the ball rolling. What we're going to talk about today is using the media to earn your reputation. Um, it's not something that's just sort of, you know, given to us. It's something we have to earn over a sustained period of time and how to build your practice. Now, I'm, t I'm talking about media today, meaning um, uh, media as in, uh, you know, mainstream media, but also with a focus on social media. Now, for those of you who recognize this lady, uh, she has a, uh, a musical offer called uh, Reputation, and there's some lyrics from a song um, that she has uh, presented here. The, she says that, um, we think we know someone, but the truth is we only know the version of them that they have chosen to show us. I, and I show you this at the beginning of this presentation so that you think in advance of what is the image that you want to present to the public through the media, media of all kinds. These days, I would say the number one challenge is to decide what aspects of yourself, your personal self and your commercial self, your legal self, if you will, do you want to share authentically in public in front of other people and then frame that accordingly? Now, there's another book that's out recently, and lawyers, you know, lawyers are like doctors, like teachers, you know, professors, lawyers now get rated, right? And um, everyone has um, the potential of getting one of these uh, five star, four star, three, whatever star ratings. Um, there is a new book called The Reputation Game, for those of you who are interested in this. Um, and it talks about how reputation is what other people say about us. And in this uh, post-fact or post-truth uh, fake news world, um, it's not really, this disagrees with Taylor Swift, it's not really what you really are, but what others perceive you to be. So there is a real uh, difference, actually, uh, between image and between reputation. Some people think that image and reputation are synonymous, but actually they are distinct things. An image is what you frame today, the picture that you draw of yourself through a social media share or how you come across on television or how you're quoted in a, in a trade pub. It's what people see. It's kind of a superficial and, and fleeting image. It's something that you uh, provide, something that you proactively program into the public domain. Now, reputation is something that you don't really decide. Other people decide, right? And so it, it's, not, it's not in the here and now. Reputation, it builds progressively over time, and it's the sum of all of the images which you choose to portray in the public uh, during the course of your career. And it's how other people feel. An image, if it's ephemeral, if it's superficial, is contrasted by a reputation that is deeper, more emotional, and profound. So this is something that uh, is also very durable over time. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed this in your business. I'm in PR, professional services. We bill by the hour. We have timesheets too. Um, sometimes I'll hear about a, a certain PR firm, and uh, it's thought to be a, a, a hot shop. That's a really great firm. That's the firm you want to work for. But then you find out that when talking to some of the people, that image is like five years out of date. Uh, image uh, actually takes a while to, to, to grow and to build uh, and, and to turn around. Uh, but these days with social media, it doesn't, it doesn't take much time to destroy an image. Now, um, all media of every kind now flows in streams. Um, social media feeds the mainstream media. The mainstream media isn't a, a, a scheduled interval thing like it used to be. You know, we used to have the, just the evening news broadcast and we'd have sort of the morning news. I mean, Social media, it, it, it isn't pre-scheduled at predetermined time and place. It's always on. The mainstream media is always on. Um, there is almost always a difference now between the print edition of the Globe and Mail in the morning and the online version, which you can continually update well into the evening. 
Now, every organization, every law firm can basically be its own media organization. You can, through your own properties online, your website, and through your social channels, um, you, you can basically do uh, what mainstream media can do. Now, uh, Bill and Mike have seen this before, but let's just remember, we have this thing called the media cloverleaf. I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, you, this presentation will be available for you, but there are four kinds of, uh, four uh, leafs on, on this. Uh, traditional media, um, uh, newspapers, television, what have you. Owned media, your web channel, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. How many of you, by the way, uh, are on, um, let's just, do you mind if I do a show of hands? How many of you are on LinkedIn? Everybody, good. How many of you are on uh, Instagram? Let's see. Okay, good number. How many of you are on Twitter? Okay, not bad. That's, that's yeah, wow. Okay. Uh, Pinterest. Anybody on Pinterest? Overwhelmingly female, as suspected. <laughs> Uh, Snapchat, we're really pushing the envelope now. Okay, a younger constituency for that one, right? Okay, so the selection of your social channels, very important, but let, let's move on. Um, a lot of the traditional trade media um, has basically gone from a print weekly to a continuously updated ongoing uh, web channel. So all of these interact with uh, search at the center. All of these sources of media content uh, go into the page one of Google. Um, now let's just think, let's just talk about different kinds of, of media here for a moment. Um, TV frames a, uh, uh, the media image. Um, television is still very important, I think. Not so much sometimes for the number of people watching it right now, but for the number of people, your clients, potential clients, stakeholders, who are going to see it in your social media feed, um, which is where I got lots of interaction when I took my son to the Global News Studio uh, so that he could be on the, uh, the news with the weatherman. Um, uh, my son's interested in weather. Anyway, so this, um, you know, the frame, getting that frame um, isn't just, getting on television isn't just about who's watching at that time. It's about these people through social. Um, and I just want to show, I mean, I do a lot of stuff on BNN, and I just wanted to show you this. Uh, you know, it's very important for you to think about how you look before you go on to these different programs, right? What are the colors in the background? Uh, do your clothes match those colors? Um, uh, do you think to provide your correct spelling of your name and your company organization? Um, do, you, do you have that, have you thought ahead of time of why you're there? So TV is very important, but you know, as far as I'm concerned, print media is still at the top of the uh, media food chain. Now, print, print uh, has declined. There are fewer daily newspapers, fewer journalists working at newspapers, which I think is a terrible thing for society. But the good news is a million people a day still uh, get some information from the Globe and Mail, for example, across this country. And it's important to be in print because uh, radio, which has a, a resilience, and uh, other forms of media will still know who is the expert, uh, who is uh, the one to go to based on who's quoted in the print media. And Google, uh, and it's all about that page one on Google, it'll give a lot of Google juice. There'll be a whole field of gravity around your name if you get into, if you earn through an interview with a journalist, um, a, a position of coverage in a daily newspaper, or even in an influential trade, and there are so many good ones in the uh, legal profession, both in Canada and internationally. Um, now, I've mentioned radio. Uh, radio, of course, yes, we still have, um, all, we have lots of all news, we have all kinds of talk radio programs still on the air in the uh, province of Ontario, and the, many of them are looking for inexpensive sources of content. Many of them are looking for people who could serve as guest hosts. So I think radio still um, has a role to play. And I also see uh, the role of podcasts and audio formats. Radio exists not just with a box uh, on, a, on, a, on a table or, or in your car. Radio has morphed into, into podcasts. So that these niche communities, and I know there are different areas of, of legal practice represented here, you know, whoever is 
If you're the best at this one particular niche or this one thing that you do better than anybody else, um, then that's a great idea for a podcast, right? Because it's remarkable how many people would share that um, it would, would consume that information. So I, I think that what you have to think about before you do any kind of media communication, though, is um, what is it uh, that you want um, people to do or think? I mean, this is really basically um, the challenge here, communicating the signal of your law practice, your capability, your firm, uh, through the noise of the marketplace, which comes from other voices, other channels, uh, limited attention spans, your competitors, um, you need to tell your story to all the people who need to hear it, and you've got to think about this beforehand so that people are going to do and think what you want them to do and think. Uh, choose your firm. Uh, want to work at your firm. Um, um, uh, maybe pay more by the hour uh, because they think that your brand uh, is, is the one in public who they're proud because they like to tell their friends who their amazing firm is. I mean, th these, these are the reasons why you want to get your name out there. Um, I, I think that uh, knowing who you are, uh, na you know, name recognition, visibility, understanding what you do, but also thinking highly of you and, and agreeing with you. And for those of you who have to deal uh, in litigation situations in public, on, on court foot, uh, fr front steps, um, with, with cameras, and I mean, um, agree with your proposition in a challenging environment if there are two sides to the coin, um, so that people are... Uh, uh, educated, informed, but also um, inspired to take a, a kind of action or to believe a certain thing. You got to think about this in advance. And a lot of lawyers, and believe me, most of my clients are lawyers, well, they are not natural born communicators. Um, and just because you're a good lawyer doesn't mean that you're an ultra super communicator automatically. Now, some lawyers have the gift, there's no doubt about it. Um, but let's just look at interviews, for example. Um, this, is, this is something you've got to really wrap your, your, your head around. Um, a lot of lawyers seem to be under the impression that if they go into a media interview, all they do is, all they have to do is answer the questions. Well, actually, I think a lot of interviews fail to achieve their objective, or they go off message, or there's some sensational thing said that commands in a distracting way the coverage. I mean, uh, they fail on their objective because maybe the lawyers just answer the question and their message or their client's message is not delivered and, and it's a missed opportunity to tell a story, therefore. Um, I would say that um, the way uh, legal professionals should look at the media uh, in terms of interview, they should th think about an interview as an opportunity to deliver your key message about yourself, your firm, your practice, your client. And using um, conversation uh, to communicate, conversation with the journalist, uh, the journalist as a mechanism or a delivery channel of your messaging through to their uh, readers, to their mass audience. And making the right impression, unfortunately, over time, these last few years, we've seen the decline of um, text uh, in terms of media. We've seen the uh, decline of thinking and logic through media. And what have we seen the rise of during the same period of time? Visuals, uh, pictures, vid you know, video, uh, that's on the way up. And we've seen the rise of, of feeling, feeling at a glance, feeling at a click. Uh, deciding summarily, instantly, yes, no, yes, no, this is a good company, bad company, good law firm, bad law firm. So these are the impression, making that right impression at a glance where there's no time, where, where people are just going to quickly reach some conclusion. That's extremely important to, uh, to keep in mind. Um, and I would say uh, all of you are the persona, I mean, I can't think of a business more than the law, where the, I mean, you are the personification I mean, your product is your time doing stuff for your clients, right? And it's all about your character, your personality, your way of doing things to inspire the client confidence. Use the media as an amplifier uh, to be a spokesperson, not just an answer person. Not to be passive, but to be proactive and deliver your messages, staying on that message and telling the truth all the time to key stakeholders. Uh, there are three levels of perception. Um, you know, some lawyers, older school particularly, will focus on text or saying the right thing, the fine print. But uh, actually, uh, it's the uh, visual, it's the, it's, it's the way that you look that makes that, it has the majority of influence over how you're perceived. That's, that's where the power is. 
Um, but if it's radio, of course, it's how your voice is, whether you're articulate or not, whether your voice will modulate effectively. And of course, in print, it is words, or the trades, or an op-ed you may write for the lawyers daily or whomever. That, that's, of course, uh, the most important thing to think about. Now, I started doing PR in 1989. Um, and uh, at that time, the dream scenario for any of my clients, again, many of them lawyers at that time, was getting your, your, your name in the paper on the front page of the Globe and Mail above the fold with your picture and a headline that's kind of pretty close to what your key message is, your PKM, primary key message. If you want to know what that is, you'll have to ask Bill or Mike afterward. Uh, but today, uh, what's, what's the prime real estate for PR? It's not the front page of the Globe and Mail. I mean, that's great. Uh, that's a wonderful place to be. But actually, it's page one of Google, right? Um, so you all, uh, if you want to know uh, what your image, what your reputation is through the media, uh, do that. People get their sense of reality of who you are and what you do and how good you are through Google, right? Your ratings on Google or lawyers, that, that, that uh, website that, that has the five stars or... Um, you know, so you want to make sure that you've got a good-looking Google page one, and if it's not so good, or if you don't have any pictures there, add some. Get on Twitter, get on Facebook. If, if you don't have any videos there, well, maybe get some, some of that going on. If there's hostile or negative content about you, well, maybe come up with some positive stuff that's more recent, so it'll push the negative stuff down. There are many different ways to do that. Just remember, it's all about, at the end of the day, that page one of Google. You know, you shouldn't just have like a Twitter strategy or a Facebook strategy. I mean, you should have a communication strategy. And these are just parts, these are different channels that you use. Remembering, yeah, the law, it's, it's still kind of a desktop business, right? Lots of docs. Uh, most of the client communication is done uh, uh, at work on a PC. However, um, most of the information that you're providing will be accessed at a glance on a mobile device. So in terms of form and features and uh, formatting, this is just something to keep in mind. Um, I've already mentioned the Google. This is the uh, uh, Folo uh, page one, which is pretty good, I think, actually. Um, quite good. It's, it's, it's indexed well. And here's, the, here's that, that site, lawyerratings.com. Who has a rating on, on lawyersratings.com? Could I see a show of hand? How many of you are on there? How many of you have checked? Yeah, we, so, yeah, so a few of you, right? Well, if you're a family lawyer, this is extremely important. Uh, uh, but uh, ratings are a bit of a rotten burrow, though, because if you pay the rating site more money, then sometimes you can hide certain negative reviews. But that's getting, getting too granular for today's purpose. I have to tell you that while I was asked to talk about media today, I want to focus on the fact that what people define as reality is often now basically what they can find um, online, especially fed by social media. Uh, in this country, we basically have universal penetration uh, for the uh, for the internet, um, and we, my, well, this, uh, to make a long story short, we're looking at uh, a mobile country where two thirds of the people are active on social media. Uh, so I think that's the battleground. For to, to uh, earn your reputation and, and to uh, program your, your image in an ongoing way. Now, my, uh, my old school chum, Nick Nanos, the pollster for CTV News, and um, I, I commissioned a poll from Nick. Uh, he uh, found that a large majority of Canadians believe that social media has the capacity to do the greatest damage to an individual's image uh, uh, or organizations image your firms or your your own um, and um, people think that it's, it's more powerful than other forms of media so that's what people think and I'm going to tell you I believe that to be quite true um, now social media of course could do lots of great stuff I mean you can crowdsource ideas you can ask opinions you can sign up folks you can you know, maybe uh, uh, do all these, uh, you know, amazing things, educate the people and inspire change. But as we have seen, this is what, what it's really all about right now. It's the bad stuff that we have to worry about. You can spread rumors and traffic gossip and smear opponents and rabble rouse and manipulate and spread like a propagandist would fake news to achieve purposes which may be nefarious. So public relations is ethical persuasion. Propaganda is uh, uh, unethical lying to um, get what you want through 
through means which are not um, legit. Um, social media is profoundly uh, emotional media. And these are like the seven deadly digital sins. Um, people see what other people have on social media, the way the 1% lives. And, and you know, I know there are lots of lawyers who, who are not one percenters. There are some struggling lawyers, people with small practices, or people who, uh, you know, have, have a busy lifestyle with different interests. So, but most people think lawyers are, are rich, fat cat one percenters, right? Um, and if they see a lawyer online, they're gonna think, well, that, I'm just as good as she is. I'm just as good as she is. She may be rich. I'm, I'm going to attack her now. I'm just as good as she is. They'll be jealous, envy, um, uh, anger. Uh, you know, there's no, it is scary. The number of times, and this is really, for those of you who have firms hosting panels, you know, if, I, if you have an all-male panel, uh, well, first of all, I would suggest you not have an all-male panel. Um, <laughs> But if you were to, uh, I mean, the, you know, if you were to take a picture of that panel, uh, there will be people on Twitter who will just hashtag you all male panel and they're going to attack you. Uh, even if, uh, let's say, there's a picture of three men sitting at the end of the table and that's the picture and there are three women sitting at the other side of the table. So think, you know, I've seen this happen and even when presented with the photographic evidence, uh, the women, who will attack you for all-male panel, they will not stop. They'll say, yeah, we have token women on the panel to dress it up, right? So I'm telling you, on gender, watch out. And on diversity, you know, come on. Um, you should, you sh you've got to think. It's not just a question of how it should look. It's a question of who you are and how you're doing it and the, and the people of the organization being represented and framed. If you don't do that, um, you're going you're gonna to have to, to and, and whether or not th this is meritocratic or it makes, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's, it's not a question of thinking and logic. It's what people are going to see and they're going to come at you. So be careful is all I can tell you. I really want to emphasize that point. Be careful about that. Whoever you have in charge of the uh, curation of your firm or your practices, uh, web uh, property, they, they have to be cognizant of this. So social media, uh, three quarters of Canadians think that uh, because it's heightened risk and exposure points for attacks on people and reputations, uh, it's made public relations more important. Um, and so we see a rising tide of PR spending, which is why my, my industry is prospering at the moment. Let us not forget um, that the news is a product uh, that sells. And if you want to get coverage for something that you're doing, um, what sells? Controversy sells. Um, human stories sell. You know, lawyers are uh, there at the milestone moments in the lives of, of people, many of them emotional, many of them involve high stakes situations. By the very nature of what you do, uh, maybe less so in you know, tax law <laughs> in some areas, but, but still, um, you know, what happens to real people as a result of what you do, that's, that's of, of interest. Now, unfortunately, some lawyers, uh, they will uh, come up with what doesn't sell through various media situations. I mean, I'm talking interview content, written content, web, glossy materials. You know, they'll, they'll come up with too many facts, dry data, it's kind of like a corporate speak where everything's kind of couched and careful. A lot of jargon maybe sometimes, um, or it's, it's too complex for a mass audience. So just just be careful about that. Be aware of that. If you don't want to get coverage, if you don't want people to notice, and that's okay given the situation, uh, okay, fine, that's what you want to do. Um, there are different ways to get media coverage uh, where you would provide the uh, color, uh, uh, something that's visual like a video. You would want to provide contrast, differing points of view, and you would want to not just have some tagline out there, you'd want to have facts and data and content to demonstrate what you're trying to say. Keep this in mind, folks. Every journalist with a blue check mark is on Twitter, um, which is why uh, I recommend to many of my clients that they at least be on LinkedIn. You've already done that. Um, but they should also be on Twitter, not just for the hell of it, not just because that's where a mass public is, but because that's where the journals are. Sean Fine, um, the justice, he covers the courts. Supreme Court, uh, particularly um, in, in recent times, 
Um, he is uh, on, on Twitter. They all are. Um, so uh, if you establish a connection with the journalist to get coverage for yourself, that's a great place to pitch a journal. Most reporters don't pick up the phone anymore. It's not because they got caller ID and they know it's you. It's because they're so very busy. And there have been cutbacks in the media. So they are really, they get like 300 press releases a day. They've got all these interviews. Their boss wants them to churn out more content. It used to be one article a day. Now it's like five constantly updated drafts a day. Uh, so have some sympathy in, uh, for their point of view. Um, I'm going to skip through that. That's a bit too technical. I, I want to warn you while I'm here about certain lawyer tendencies uh, which would get you in trouble. Um, now, uh, no comment you should never say. Um, you, it's okay to say, well, we, we, you know, we don't have anything to say about that, but you should never use that hackneyed phrase, no comment. If you say no comment, that means they're hiding something. If you say no comment, uh, that means um, uh, this person uh, saying it doesn't understand the media. Um, no comment is, is one way for a journalist to smell a lawyer who doesn't know what they're doing, and they'll ask harder questions as a result. I guarantee it. We categorically deny. That's a favorite. Um, I, I've seen that many times. That is not sort of an every way, everyday way of speaking. So I would say that you should avoid saying, we categorically deny. Uh, maybe it's not true, or uh, you know, uh, it's false or something, but categorically deny. That's a lawyer favorite to avoid. Uh, and recently, you know, I mean, this is crisis communications 101, but whenever someone gets in trouble in the media, they'll say, we take these allegations very seriously. We you know, and if you were to just set up a Google alert, with the keywords, we take these allegations very seriously. It's amazing how many hospitals and schools and, and corporations every day say that. And there's some you know, junior PR person uh, who has no new original way of saying it who's come up with this, this line, which again, journalists will, will zero in on, okay, so they've PR'd up. That does not look authentic. That looks like they're hiding something or there could be more there. Let's dig deeper. Now, I know that we got a, a later start um, after, uh, after two, but not that late. So I'm going to um, just pick out a, a couple of more, more thoughts to, to, to share and then conclude on that. Um, some lawyers have, uh, like any person, uh, they, they could speak in a vivid, uh, illustrative, uh, colorful, interesting, compelling way. Um, others could be fl you know, flatliners. Uh, where there's no emotion, no passion, no drive. And I would just say that communication, um, it should be, there should be ups and downs. There should be challenges overcome, obstacles surmounted. Um, there should be, you know, boy meets girl, um, client well served, case one. Um, and this has also uh, changed dramatically. Uh, Morgan Stanley did that on the left-hand side. That's what the old news cycle used to look like where there'd be breaking news, and then it would sort of quickly pick up, and it would be there for, you know, a day or two or a few maybe, and then it would sort of trail off into, into niche blogs or something. And now, and this is Facebook, this is new data from Facebook Labs, um, hours from origination on the, on the horizontal axis. Basically, if, if you make a mistake or people uh, jump on you for, for some tweet they didn't like, for example, Bang, it goes right through the roof. There's this spike, this, this intensity, this furious uh, pile on uh, of, of news, and it could feed the media, which then feeds social, but it's all, it, all burns, it all burns itself out so quickly. The bad news is it's way more intense than it used to be. The good news is no one is going to remember it a month from now because that memory is, is receding. This was on CNN a few weeks ago, and I thought you... Uh, might want to consider this. Um, news cycles actually are not really happening so much anymore as shock cycles are in. Some of this is Trump, but some of it is troubled media organizations who aren't making as much money as they used to. And how do you get those eyeballs? Do you get it from thoughtful, well-considered, nuanced coverage? Or do you get it from infotainment and scandal and celebrity and uh, murder and mayhem? I, I hate to say it, but that's the way it is right now. So you just have to be mindful of that. Um, you also have to look at um, how messaging propagates differently online. 
I mean, you could look at your website and, and if you were to take all the text of your website and put it into a word cloud generator, you could see that maybe you're emphasizing certain words, you know, the big words meaning it's mentioned more often. But then look at uh, news articles that come out or look at social media posts or shares and do word cloud uh, uh, generation and uh, compar comparative analysis. And if you see a gap, we call it a message gap analysis in my business, uh, then you can address those gaps in tailoring and modifying your, your communications program. And I think I, might, um, I think I might just sort of end on this slide um, before questions. There are more slides, but you can take a look at them later. Remember, um, there's an artificial intelligence that is behind the algorithm of Google, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, every form of media now, except for maybe linear broadcast television and broadcast radio and you know, newspapers as you, read, as you read print. This, we're not really programming uh, for people anymore. We're programming for what the algorithm is going to do. And we see this in politics, right? Um, the algorithm uh, that uh, Facebook has is economically incentivized to fan passions, uh, uh, inflame tensions, to, to drive emotional amplitude, to divide people. You know, Brexit, election of Trump, maybe right now the unity of this country. Um, you know, racial, racial matters, look at that. Look at Don Cherry this week. Pretty ugly threads on that one, on both sides. So this is what you have to keep in mind. It's not so much, what will my clients think? It's not so much, what will my colleagues think? Are they my fellow lawyers? It's more like, um, what will the algorithm think? Um, and what are the needs of the algorithm? What words should I use? What, 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 how should we process that post so that we give the algorithm what it wants? So the algorithm will serve up our content uh, to the audiences who are important to my professional and our firm's success.